to measure how far the army had marched from the royal city. When the wheel outside is turned, it drives a small standing gear wheel inside. The large gear wheel drives a small gear flywheel, which again drives a large wheel. A lever on the big wheel will trigger the string to hit the drum when the wheel has turned enough. Now the little lever is in a position to be triggered. It is triggered and the string on the drum is hit. What is remarkable about this odometer is that its gear systems match precisely those in today's motorcycle engines. One of the keys to the rangefinding chariot was the gear system within it, uh, and here is an example showing a section motorcycle engine, and this engine is, in, is currently in bottom gear, and you can see that you need a number of turns of the engine in order to make the output sprocket of the motorcycle go along. So this is gearing down the speed of the engine to the speed of the sprocket. The same would have happened in the rangefinding chariot, only that it would have been an even greater reduction, so that you would have had for every 500 yards, the main wheel with the trigger would have just turned once. This type of machinery demonstrates that the Chinese possessed an early understanding of the elements that are used in jack work in today's modes of transport. But there is intriguing evidence of the application of gear engineering on a massive industrial scale during the Song Dynasty. One discovery in particular has caused scholars to rethink their views on ancient manufacturing. And we now know that the Chinese had fully operational, huge factories capable of mass production. The zenith of ancient Chinese innovation took place under the Song Dynasty, which lasted from 960 to 1279 AD and was based in eastern China. This was a 300-year period of incredible inventions and machines. They revolutionized warfare and even led to man exploring space, using navigational instruments that guided mankind's journey of discovery. Only now are we discovering that these intriguing machines fundamentally match the principles of today's modern technology, causing us to ask, did we invent modern machines, or did we just reinvent them? At the height of the Song Dynasty in the 11th century, Huge cities had begun to develop that were centers for trade, industry, and commerce. With populations of hundreds of thousands, they required automated machines that could increase the output of production. One such ancient industrial machine, recently discovered by archaeologists, is the hydraulic trip hammer, believed to have first been developed two millennia ago. Today, in the province of Jingdeishen, an example of this extraordinary ancient technology is still in use, a testament to the machine's effective design. A trip hammer is a good example of one of these water wheel powered devices. Basically you have a large mass that is supported by a cam and as the cam is rotated the mass is lifted uh, and then the mass is allowed to fall. The system was amazingly advanced for its time. The machine actually consisted of several hammers, which were operated by a series of cams or lugs on the main revolving shaft. The hydraulic machine converts the kinetic and gravitational potential energy stored in running water into rotational power in a water wheel. The wheel is attached to a long transverse axle. There are several wooden boards inserted into the revolving shaft, with each board controlling one hammer. The wheel causes the shaft to rotate, which in turn moves the lugs. As they turn, these lift the hammers. When they have turned 60 degrees and the hammer is at full height, they release the heavy mallet, which falls and pounds the material below. Each hammer could crush up to 50 kilos of force, meaning that all eight hammers could operate a total of 400 kilos of force in a single rotation. The ancient texts tell us that this mega machine was adapted to not only crush grain, but to pound metal in industrialized automated metal workshops, just as is still done today. 
the labour saving potential is enormous. Instead of perhaps having to have five or six blacksmiths, each with a £10 sledgehammer, you could have one 70, 80, 100 pound, 200 pound mass being lifted and dropped a considerably bigger distance. And this could be then used by just one or perhaps two men working, uh, and that saves you labour, but enables you to make bigger things as well. Today, the remains of mega water wheels that powered the hammers still litter the landscapes of rural provinces, offering a fascinating glimpse of what these hydraulic machines actually looked like. But the Chinese soon invented a more efficient way to grind grains, using millstones. The grain is crushed under a massive stone weight. This is a tried and tested technique, but the ancient Chinese took the technology to an advanced level. This machine is called the multiple geared grist mill. As with the trip hammer machine, the multiple geared mill was also powered by water. However, this machine harnessed the power of the water wheel to drive a complex angled gearing system and power nine separate two-ton millstones. Remarkably, the engineers devised an advanced system that transferred the water power via the drive shaft across a 90 degree angle change to drive the millstones. We have this one enormous wheel which has got a shaft fixed to it and on this shaft are a whole series of gears which are providing the motive power and then from these there are a series of right angle gears which are changing the direction of the rotation and allows a whole series of different millstones to be driven off one shaft. This is a very economical way of generating the required power. The extraordinary thing about this type of ancient Chinese gear-powered water mill is that it incorporated technology not to be seen again for nearly a thousand years. What we're looking at really is almost a precursor of the Industrial Revolution. This was industrialization on a scale which we would recognize today. The sophistication of ancient Chinese gear technology was highly advanced, and there's more evidence that the Chinese had a long tradition of ingenious geared machines. Beautiful, engraved jade rings were discovered in tombs dating back to 400 BC. Their spiral design has intrigued scholars. After studying their design, archaeologists now believe that the only possible way to produce the precision spirals must have been by using a machine. A device known as a compound machine is one that synchronizes rotational with linear motion. This means that as one part of the machine turns the disc, the other draws the line in perfect synchronicity, with a geometric accuracy that is impossible to achieve by hand. Richard Windley has been studying the Chinese rings and has created a compound machine capable of such precision designs. To produce this kind of curvature would really need a machine which was capable of rotating and moving in a linear fashion at the same time. This is what we call a compound machine. I've actually built a small model which will demonstrate this process. It consists of a turntable on which a blank or disc to be marked out is mounted and a linear rod which moves across it. This rod holds the pen which is going to mark out the spirals and by moving the rod backwards and forwards the pen traverses the blank as the blank is actually rotating and this produces what is known as a true Archimedean spiral. But what we also have is a gearing system which relates the movement of this bar and the movement of the turntable in a very controlled mathematical method. There are two uprights attached to the end of the bar that moves the pen across the blank. These uprights are attached to a string that is wound round a disc under the device. So as the bar moves back and forth, the string turns the disc in perfect sync. It is this disc that rotates the blank and creates the perfectly synchronized designs. I'm now going to load the little bamboo brush with drawing ink. Since these rings would have a series of flutes, they varied in number. In my case, I've got eight divisions, so we'll repeat this eight times, and that should give us the perfect, complete design. We now know that this type of compound machine may have been used either to mark up the jade or by the direct action of a diamond-tipped stylus. Over thousands of years, technological innovations filtered slowly but steadily from east to west, carried through Central Asia over the 6,000-kilometer Silk Route. 
but there's an extraordinary archaeological site that provides us with a unique insight into the capabilities of ancient Chinese engineers and craftsmen. The first emperor of China's terracotta army is startling evidence of the magnificence and grandeur of the ancient world. Located near Xi'an in eastern China, it is considered by many to be the eighth wonder of the ancient world. The discovery of this tomb and the excavation of it is one of the top archaeological finds of the whole world. It's as important as the pyramids, if not more important, and though there are many, many tombs in China, nothing like this scale is seen in any other part of China. Buried near the Emperor Qin's tomb, to defend him in the afterlife, ancient Chinese craftsmen and engineers created over 8,000 warrior statues of breathtaking quality. Even more extraordinary is that these warriors are actually armed with over 10,000 fully functioning lethal bronze weapons. Warriors of the age would have used copies of these exact weapons when they engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. More than 2,000 years later, they still have the capacity to inflict enormous damage. Archaeologists believe that these weapons, along with the warriors themselves and their body armor, were mass-produced in ancient factories. But how did the emperor's engineers approach the complexities of high-quality mass production? And what technology was used to create some of the world's most beautiful and impressive objects? Each figure is individually sculpted, cast, polished, showing the, the sort of production techniques which were not generally introduced in Europe until the 18th century. The sheer scale of the discovery is mind-blowing, and even today, some 30 years after the discovery, archaeologists are still uncovering hundreds of ancient weapons and artefacts. Arguably the most impressive finds from the excavations so far are the Emperor's chariots. It's thought that these full-scale vehicles would have been used for the Emperor's inspection tours in his afterlife. Investigations into their production have revealed that during the Qin Dynasty, the Chinese, through careful practice and detailed research, had established highly advanced scientific standards for metallurgy and metal production. The bronze chariot could indeed present the highest achievement during the bronze casting history in ancient China. These two chariots were each made of 3,000 components. Every single component was made alone and combined together later with others. In total, the emperor's chariots comprise 3,642 separate parts of gold, silver or bronze. What is particularly remarkable is that each was individually cast before assembly. It would have been like hand carving all the pieces of a three and a half thousand piece jigsaw puzzle separately, whilst never being able to match each piece to its neighbors until the project was complete, all the while ensuring the fit was perfect. Most of the joins were made using a technique known as cast welding. Welding is the technique of joining two pieces of metal using extremely high temperatures and a solder to create a very strong bond. Cast welding of iron is very difficult even today, as cast iron has a carbon content ten times that of steel, and this high carbon content causes the metal to flake. Managing the temperature of the process is critical, and this requires a highly advanced knowledge of temperatures and the properties of metals. Inlaying was also used. This complicated process involves inserting a piece of one metal into a slot in another, a challenging technique that the ancient Chinese mastered. These were highly advanced processes that we still